afternoon. I'm Anuj Mehrotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and I am delighted to welcome you to this session in the George Talks Business Series. Let me start by introducing our moderator for the session today. Please join me in welcoming Selene Matus, Executive Director of the International Institute of Tourism Studies at our School of Business. Selene has been an adjunct lecturer for the Masters in Tourism Administration program for six years. A native of Belize, Selene previously served as the country's Director of Tourism. She was also the Vice President of Global Programs at Sustainable Travel International, a founding member of the Mesoamerican Ecotourism Alliance, and served on the Global Sustainable Tourism Council's Board of Directors. Thank you, Selene, for moderating the session today. Good morning. It's great to be here, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome our guest, Roger Dow, the president and CEO of U.S. Travel Association, a Washington, D.C.-based organization representing all segments of travel in America. As the leading travel industry advocate, Dow and his team regularly confer with administration and congressional leaders to advance policies that benefit the broader travel industry. His efforts have resulted in major legislative victories, including securing pandemic-related relief for the hard-hit travel industry, establishing and renewing Brand USA, the highly effective national travel and tourism promotion program, and procuring funds to maintain America's treasured national parks. For his efforts to unify the travel industry and increase its effectiveness on Capitol Hill, Dow has received multiple honors and awards. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Roger Dow. Well, thank you very much, Dean. And I have a great affection for GW. Uh, I've got many people on my team. They're graduates of your master's program. And thank you for preparing them so well. They're brilliant. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. It is over to you, Selene. Well, thank you, Dean Marotra. And, you know, it's such a delight to be here this morning. Um, I was uh, so humbled when the tourism faculty uh, invited me to interview Roger, who is not only very important uh, to the industry in which GW's academic programs prepare students uh, to join, uh, but is also a very inspiring leader who can articulate the present state of economic and political affairs and the path going forward in an accessible way. So thank you, Roger, for taking time to be with us today. Um, our first question is not surprisingly about leadership in a crisis. So in March 2020, the U.S. tourism industry entered into an unprecedented economic nosedive from which the pandemic has not allowed it um, as yet to fully recover. Um, how specifically did you lead the U.S. Travel Association to work and coordinate with other industry uh, trade associations, state tourism offices, and others to really manage through and get behind the tourism industry's requests for financial and policy relief uh, from Congress and the administration. Well, Selene, it's great to see you again. You're a dear friend and a, a great leader in our industry and very knowledgeable and uh, great to get to know you over the years. Uh, you know, U.S. travel uh, represents the entire travel industry. So our members are all the airlines, the hotel companies, the destinations, the states, the payment systems, distribution. So if it's travel, it's U.S. travel. And our mission had been for 50 years to increase travel to and within the United States. Well, in March, that mission changed. We had a pivot on a dime uh, and pivot from promoting the and growing the industry to survival, relief, and now stimulus uh, to really get things moving again. Uh, let me put it in perspective. The past 18 months, the industry's lost over 700 billion, that's with a B, dollars. But worse is the unemployment. Uh, we have about 16 or 17 million people, one in 10 Americans get their job through travel and tourism. In May of last year, 50% were unemployed, 50%. To put that in perspective, 
the Great Depression in 1933 was the worst year of unemployment in the United States, and it was 26 percent. So for the travel industry, this was two times the Great Depression. So what have we had to do? Uh, you mentioned March. Uh, I recall vividly on March 17th being at the White House. I was meeting with the president, the vice president, secretary of commerce, with several CEOs from the industry saying we're going to need relief for this industry. It's going to be really a problem. This thing could go well into the summer. Little did I realize that we were talking about the wrong summer. It was another summer later. Uh, so the devastation was huge. So we, we really begin rewriting our priorities and our agenda to getting uh, PPP funds for payroll protection, uh, the COVID relief funds, the industry. And now we're talking about what's called economic development funds that will stimulate the economy. The first thing we had to do was tackle health and safety. Uh, we never knew what to do. We never had this happen before. You know, we've had flus and things like that, but also in the industry had to come together and as an industry start building confidence, one for their employees that were coming to work, but also for travelers that we knew how to handle this. So we brought the whole industry together and we established protocols that the whole industry backed up and then some took them in different ways, whether it be airlines or hotels or theme parks, but set up protocols with medical experts. We brought epidemiologists and physicians and uh, people from the, uh, the hygiene area of cleaning and all that to really understand. We put that together. Uh, when you looked at it, we were able to get uh, $60 billion relief for the businesses and, and workers. Uh, several ways we got that. One was first the CARES Act, and that was uh, 570, or th $370 billion, and uh, a huge amount of that we're able to get to airports and to travel areas. But a huge problem was, was a uh, mistake was made. When they put the CARES Act together, they eliminated what they call 501c6s. Not to get too technical, but they're nonprofit groups like destination marketing organizations, the Convention and Visitors Bureaus. But in doing that, they also eliminated museums, cultural centers, Broadway, a whole swath of uh, the economy. And so we had to work very hard. It took us another six months to get PPP for the employees in the uh, lodging business. So, so many of them in restaurants and hotels were just out of work and with no relief or other industries were getting relief. Then we started working on the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that was about $350 billion. And uh, we've got uh, that to the states and to the destinations so they could re rebuild and uh, bring back their businesses. Uh, now we're working on, uh, there's $3 billion of what they call EDA grants. That's Economic Development uh, Associated or Appropriation or something like that. It's with the uh, Commerce Department. We are able to get 25% of that earmarked to go to the travel industry. So there's now $750 million out there for destinations and for projects to bring back employment, et cetera. 27% uh, of all the states and destinations have taken advantage of these funds already, and it's made a major difference. And the last piece we had to do was put on webinars. As you, as you know, uh, dealing with the government isn't easy, and it's so complex. So what we did is a series of webinars. We must have had 10, 15 of them talking about how do you access the funds? What are our protocols and all that? And we, we found that communications was one of the most important things to do. So this has been one heck of a, what I call the biggest game of whack-a-mole I've ever played in my life. But I do believe we're seeing the other side of this coming forward soon. Well, I think that the efforts that USTA has made, especially in regards to ensuring that destination organizations in places that play such a central role in bringing all the sort of tourism stakeholders together and during COVID, of course, other stakeholders far beyond the tourism together that they too were held together and made it through. So um, those efforts are, especially the EDA grants uh, that are now becoming available, we see it and feel it and, you know, are seeing how destinations are using these funds now to 
sort of re to pivot as well much further than maybe they had ever imagined in rethinking their purpose and their place um, within the tourism system. So uh, thanks for your leadership on that. Now, we know that one of the areas that you're really well known for since you took the helm of USTA in 2005 is consolidating support in Congress and also the federal government for the industry at large. Um, how has the federal government helped or impeded your leadership priorities? And how much does the strategic plan for this year depend on a cooperative federal response? Well, first of all, when I uh, got into this role, uh, for those listening, I was with Marriott for 34 years and then became the head of US travel in 2005. Uh, and I noticed that uh, I, we were the industry of, uh, for those a little older, will understand Rodney Dangerfield, the comedian of who always said, we get no respect. And we were the industry that got no respect. We were seen as the low paying industry, the bottom jobs and all that. And Congress really never understood what a career path there is in this industry. I mean, every one of us in this industry started taking tickets or flipping hamburgers. I was a lifeguard my first job. I'm not a lifeguard anymore, although it was one of the best jobs I've ever had. Uh, but the, maybe I am a lifeguard. But when you think about it, but the bottom line is we had a role for, for the past 10 years, uh, 12 years of getting Congress to understand, getting communities to understand the value of travel and tourism. And uh, they were thinking very narrowly. They, they think about travel and tourism as just being the jobs. But the thing that I, we had to get across and get Congress to understand is travel and tourism is a front door to economic development. Nothing happens until someone makes a trip. No one decides where they wanna to move to or get a second home till they've traveled there. No one moves a company or a headquarters or an office somewhere till they first traveled there, or been to a meeting. No student has decided whether they'd go to GW or any other from people from around the world until they first traveled there and they've been to Washington or they've been to where they wanna to go to school. And so you think about it, we have a link to the entire economy. Well, now it became much more important to show that how that link was so important to the overall economy and jobs, having all these people unemployed. And we, we had to get the administration and Congress to understand how critical it is to restart travel. Uh, we've been very fortunate to see domestic travel come back pretty strongly this past summer. Uh, in fact, in many areas, it's very close to 2019 levels but you can't live on domestic alone. We need to bring back business travel, professional meetings and events, and international travel and all those things. Uh, we're fortunate we've, we've been banging away at the government to open up international inbound. Uh, I think we were slow as far as the government to do that. Uh, Americans could go to EU, could go to UK, could go to Canada, Mexico, South America, if they're vaccinated, but they couldn't come here. So finally, in September, we got the administration to announce that in early November, they would open international travel to vaccinated travelers come to the United States. Last week, they announced the official date will be November the 8th. So in just a couple of weeks, we'll be able to welcome inbound travel. Well, what happened when that announcement was made? First of all, in international travel to the United States was $250 billion, uh, our second largest uh, export uh, and a big, uh, surplus in cash uh, in 2019, and that ground down by losing 90% of all of that. So it was very important to bring that back. The day that it was announced in September that the government was going to open international travel, uh, British Airways told me their bookings went up 700% the next day. That evening, British Air Holidays, uh, been in business for 30, 40 years, had the fourth biggest day of bookings to the United States they've had in the history of the company. Lufthansa bookings went through the roof. So there's a huge pent up demand, but we've had to get the government to understand if we don't open up business travel, meetings and events and international, the economy is gonna be a long time recovering. So they've finally gotten that and we're looking forward to seeing that come back in a very, very big way. That's so hopeful. Um, I think, you know, we've all been waiting for this day and look forward uh, to uh, the eighth coming. Um, it couldn't get here faster. Um, and talking about different sort of uh, segments of travel before COVID, national politics um, were impacted 
impacting foreign student travel and foreign student enrollments uh, in a very negative way. How is U.S. Travel Association currently helping the U.S. to regain foreign travel and especially student market share? You know, going back, I'm going to go back about eight or 10 years on this subject because it's very important. Uh, and uh, it was during the Bush administration that there was trouble getting uh, visas and getting people to come into this, to get to this country across the board. So the government moved forward and they said, we can't do everything, but we're going to step up student visas. What I had explained to the government is if the students' parents can't get here, the students aren't going to come here. And so they, they, they were, so they were opening up student visas, but they were ignoring their parents and their relatives. Mm -hmm. And so parents and relatives were saying, if my child, if I can't come see them during their four or five years they're here in the United States, I'm not going to send them there. I'll send them to Canada or UK or somewhere else for their education. So it was important to get that happen. So now we hit this again, this big speed bump. And as those who are international students understand uh, F1, M1 visas, and that's basically the, the visa that you come in as a student. Well, they've been down uh, 20, 25 percent. Uh, but the bigger problem is getting those visas uh, approved of actually getting through the process. There's a wait time of three to five months. So you have a student that, yes, they can come to the United States, but now they've got to get their visa if they're coming from, let's say, South America or Asia or places like that that are not visa waiver countries. So that's very important. Uh, we're seeing new students this past year from outside the United States, we're down 72%. And I understand it's a major part of the fabric of universities, especially like GW, who have a huge international contingent. And this is so important because my belief is not only when students come here, uh, so many of these brightest people in the world decide to stay here and augment our organization and in our industry. And so it's very important and even more important, they return as do international visitors to their countries with a very sweet spot in their heart for their time in the United States. I maintained for years uh, in the Middle East, one of the biggest uh, pluses that we always had is the leaders and uh, the royalty and the companies and all that they were all educated in the United States. They all came to the US for their education. And, and that really, although they didn't wear it on their sleeve, it was a very important part of having a dialogue and a positive atmosphere. So bringing students here is more important than just the education. It has long-term economics, long-term diplomatic uh, impact. So that's very good. So I say it's the, we're trying to get the visas uh, sped up. Uh, in uh, June, we're getting better. It's now about 90% of what it was in processing. But the, the biggest Achilles heel is somebody saying, I want to start school on this date, but I'm, I'm, I sometimes don't get their visa till a week before. And it, it's right down to the wire. So we're trying to get that sped up. It's very, very important. Otherwise, the students, which we value so much, can't come here from other countries. Well, this is such a uh, an area that's uh, close to our heart here as, uh, at GW, as you've mentioned, and count on our support. And I, I think, uh, you know, the academic community at large to work with U.S. Travel Association on some of these issues. I think there may be opportunities for us doing more with you on, on that front, for sure. Um, this, this whole issue of um, how much the global pandemic has devastated tourism and the hospitality workforce. You know, you've mentioned mentioned it so far. What do you think are ways that the tourism industry can better support and rebuild uh, its human capital while at the same time struggling to recapture a healthy bottom line? Yeah, let me put this in perspective. Uh, according to McKenzie, 43% uh, of global organizations are looking for people. They're trying to hire. According to Goldman Sachs, 81% of those companies are having trouble filling these jobs. Presently in the United States, there are 4 million open hosp travel and hospitality jobs. There are 10 million open jobs. So of all the open, unfilled jobs, 40% are in our industry, 40%, yet we're one in 10 employees. So it's four times the employment level. Uh, what we have to do as an industry is we've got to rethink uh, jobs. We've got to rethink work. I was at uh, an event the U.S. Chamber of Commerce held with the CEOs of multiple companies together. And unfortunately, what I heard at that meeting was the same old thing. 
Well, we'll have to pay people more. Well, we'll have to give them a little bit better benefits, maybe some education opportunities. And I think we've got to re-step step back and look at the demographics, look at the changes. There's an absolute change in the demographics among people that are 20 to 35 years old, 35 to 50 and over 50 years old. Very different look. One thing this pandemic has said to people is had them take a look at their lifestyle and, and work and how they approach work. I think we've got to get flexibility. We've got to provide more flexibility. Uh, we've got to build an economy where people may want to work three days a week and uh, they may want to work at Marriott on one day and Hilton on another day. And we've got to be able to figure that out. We've got to take jobs and make them aspirational. We've got to use technology more. And there's all sorts of ways that we're going to have to uh, really rethink the future of jobs. And we've got to improve the pipeline. I mean, those students that are going into your programs, they decided they wanted to be in this industry. When I grew up, most people, you ended up in, by accident. I ended up in an accident in this business because I had a summer job as a lifeguard at a hotel called Marriott. And they had six hotels at the time. I went to work for Marriott, by the way, because the GM of that hotel told me that sometime, someday they may have 100 hotels. So I signed up. I said, put me in the game, 100 hotels. But of course, now Marriott has almost 8,000 hotels. Uh, but uh, so many times, years ago, there weren't these programs like you have. It was uh, Cornell, Michigan State, uh, Las Vegas, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and FIU. There are about four or five programs. Well, now there's programs all over the country. And the, the other thing we've got to do is we've got to get other disciplines like the business school uh, to look at this industry. If you want to be in finance, there's huge financial opportunities in this industry, developing hotels. If you want to be in construction, architecture, just think of all the design things. You can work with Disney, with theme parks, with airports, with hotels. If you want to manage the, so I, there's not a curriculum that's discussed in the business school that doesn't have a counteractive job. And the career opportunities in this industry are huge. We did some research with the Bureau of Economics and we went back 40 years and we said, Look at the long-term pay over a career of people from the various industries, uh, health and wealth, uh, you know, health and wealth, health care, uh, manufacturing, financial services, uh, finance, lodging, all that. And it turns out the only industry that has a lifetime higher income than uh, the travel and tourism industry is financial services, and that's by four tenths of one percent. So if someone started in this industry and stayed in this industry or had their first two or three years, their lifetime earning is bigger than any other industry except a half a percent for financial services, bigger than manufacturing, bigger than healthcare, but people don't know that. And the last piece is we've got to improve the, uh, the, the pipeline. Uh, while you're talking about it in your school, there's virtually no high school teacher that I know of except maybe in resort areas the saying to their people, have you considered hospitality? Have you considered lodging? Have you considered the convention business? And we've got to get high school teachers to understand, to get people thinking about no matter what I want in, in whatever career I want to pursue, there's a giant opportunity. And the last piece is for people to understand that this is everywhere. If you're in uh, technology, you better be working in the uh, DC area, New England, parts of Texas, and mostly the West Coast. If you work in Oklahoma, you're not getting a technology job. If you're in hospitality and healthcare or hospitality and travel, you can work anywhere, Fargo to Fort Lauderdale, uh, San Francisco to Shanghai. There's a job everywhere in the country for you, and it's gonna be the biggest workforce uh, in the world. So the opportunities are, are huge, and we've gotta get people to understand that. Wonderful insights, uh, you know, and the challenge is clear too. We need to really dig deeper and think outside the box about how it is that we create the flexibility needed and go far beyond um, where, you know, the, the areas that we've been thinking about um, that are important to employees in our industry. But it is right. There's a job in tourism anywhere in the world. And this is something that we need to do a better job to convey as well. Um, so thinking about the um, area of building or rebuilding confidence in travel, we know that you've led the campaign travel confidently this year. And I'm just wondering what 
um, have you been seeing as the success so far in retaining uh, business as well as leisure travel here in the U.S.? Well, as I started earlier, I said the first thing we had to do is bring an industry together to talk about protocols. While our industry has always done a terrific job in you know, hygiene and cleanliness and food service and all that. You know, it's it's been part of the industry, but never have we been as challenged as uh, with the pandemic, with the cruise lines do a phenomenal job. Again, had to really rethink and step up the airlines. And uh, we had the job of getting people to understand that these are very safe places. Uh, Harvard University did a study on air, air traffic and the chances of you getting COVID on a plane flying from Europe to the United States are one in one million. Over 400 million people have flown since January in the United States, and we have yet to trace any COVID you know, cases back to that. It's You're 10 times safer on a plane than you are in a grocery store. Just think of it. You're a grocery store. No one's wearing masks. They're picking up fruit, putting it down, handling things. On a plane, you've got an air system that the air changes every two minutes on a plane. Those are these HEPA filters, just like they have in a hospital uh, operating room. The the sanitation of uh, that's taken place. The technology, fortunately, has been here. Uh, your phone is going to be your credit card, your room key, and all that. And people are touch, going so much touchless food food handling, uh, how that's that's done, and all those things are combining. But we have to get people to understand that. The, the challenge we have is people thinking it's not safe and the media is not helping with this. The media is talking about, you know, all the, you know, the spread and the vaccine. That's all you hear on the news. When you look at the reality, if you look at what is happening with case counts, you look at uh, how safe an airplane is. We've got to get that word out. We've had the Mayo Clinic do studies for us. Ohio State University said you're safer at a professional meeting and event than you are at a mass festival or somewhere like that. So we need to people get on to understand that. I was at a big event we had recently, and one of the uh, gentlemen who's worth it with a, one of the convention bureaus was walking into the hotel and he had a bag from CVS. And I said, oh, you forgot your toiletries? He said, no. He said, I had to go get two tests. My wife wants me to take two negative tests before I come home to her and the kids. And, but it was that thinking, but that meeting we had 700 people we had one COVID case and the COVID case was the first day. So the person arrived with it, but after, and, and so we've got to get people to understand, to get uh, people in corporations to understand, to put their people on the road, to go to these meetings and events. So that's why this whole travel confidently is so important. I was with Ed Bastian the other day, who's the uh, CEO of Delta Airlines and Ed kiddingly said, but I don't think so kiddingly, he said, you know, we used to we change our seats about every six, seven years or so. He said, I think we're going to have to change them every couple of years because people are wiping the leather off the seats with all their back and forth with sanitizers and things like that. So, but it is so safe to travel there, and we've just got to get this industry going again and get people to understand that we're not part of travel. When I take a trip, the first thing my neighbors say, how was it? What was going on? Yet now I'm going to airports. They're packed. I was in LA the other day, jammed. Uh, I went, uh, flew out of DCA, longest line I've seen to get through TSA, I've seen in a long time. But a lot of these travelers, the majority of them are leisure travelers. The leisure travelers are traveling in droves. We now have to bring back business, international, and meetings and events. Wonderful. So as we sort of pull our conversation to a close here, Roger, um, I know that you don't have a crystal ball and um, there's no way, of course, of controlling the COVID policies here on the home frontier in the U.S. or, uh, you know, globally. What do you see as the current outlook for the U.S. Uh, tourism industry and its position in the global marketplace? If you had an economist on this uh, webinar or you would, if you ask them the question, they would say it's going to be 24 to 25, 2024, 20, 25 before the industry comes back. I think they're all wrong. They've been wrong over and over again. Uh, September 11th, after September 11th, they said no one would go on an international flight again for fear of terrorism, followed by the 15 of the biggest years of international travel ever. 
2008 recession. Uh, headlines were 30% of all hotels in America never to open again, to have to become apartment buildings because not enough people are traveling, followed by 10 years of every single month being bigger than the month before. We had a 10 year run up to February of 2020 of every single month being bigger than the one before. So I think travel's like a coiled spring. It's going to come back. Domestic is already back. Domestic leisure is already back to 90, 95% of where it was. So, and that's gonna just get stronger. International, uh, as I say, the pent up demand, I think you're gonna see that. The slower area to come back, I believe, will be Asia. It'll be a little slower bringing Asia back. And that's such an important market. Uh, when we started working on China, we had 300,000 Chinese visitors uh, about 10 years ago to the US. 2019, we had 3.2 million. So to give you the, the huge opportunity that is, so we've got to bring back Asia. It's going to come back a little slower. But I think once people start seeing each other travel, as we open up, we're going to see international. And then the big thing, when meetings and conventions come back, we have a challenge with meetings and conventions with three challenges. One, the corporate uh, chief financial officers are in the boardroom saying, look, nobody went to a meeting, nobody traveled the past 18 months, and our profits are phenomenal. Maybe we don't need them to travel. Well, that's going to end when you go on a trip and you get the business and I stayed home and try to do it over the internet. I'm going to get back on the road to try and get that business. That's going to change. We saw that happen in 2008. The companies that got their people traveling again never looked back. They, they picked up market share. They picked up margins over the competitors who were standing there wondering what happened. And the last is professional meetings and events. It's a little slower starting, but we're seeing the bookings for professional meeting events going up significantly. Uh, the bookings for next year are bigger than they were in 2019. It, they keep sliding. When you hear a little bad news, people move their meeting a little bit. They move it to uh, two months later or whatever. But when that comes back, it's gonna come back because when someone gets out of GW, adult learning stops. and I keep saying we've got the wrong terminology. Meetings and events shouldn't be called meetings and events. They should be called adult education. You learn when you best practices. You learn what's going on when you go to a convention or a meeting. And uh, it's the only way you, you grow your business. So they're going to come back. So I'm optimistic. I think that 2022 is going to be a good year. It won't be quite where 2019 is. But I predict, and you come back and see me in 2023, that 2023 will be bigger than 2019, and the economists are wrong. Well, this is very hopeful, and we'll end on that positive note, um, noting, of course, that our industry has demonstrated its resilience, and Roger, you're saying it's here, and, and we'll see this um, occur much faster. It's come back than, than, than others are predicting. So thank you so much for spending time with us today, um, for your insight into a topic that so directly and emphatically impacts us here at GW, um, also our city and the country. We appreciate your leadership during this very difficult time and hope that you will come back very soon uh, to share the story of the industry's recovery and its revived growth trajectory. Um, I would... I was just gonna say, I'll, I'll be happy to do that, but I'm gonna do, if you don't hate me, I'm gonna send you a copy of uh, something I, I spoke at a, a hotel graduation, hotel school, of 10 things your professors never taught you. And uh, God bless you for the great education you give people, but I talk about 10 things that were really not talked about a lot that I look back on my career that were extremely important in addition to what I learned at school. So I'll send that to you, and if some students want it, you can share it with them. That would be wonderful, Roger. And if you'd like, you know, to maybe mention the top one to here, we could close off on that note too. Yep. Uh, number one, learn to speak, learn to make speeches, learn to make presentations. It's why you're a great professor because you can speak eloquently and, and capture people's attention. If you can't make a presentation, you're not going to be in the boardroom. You're not, so make speeches and start, even if it's a little club or somewhere, but make speech. Second is communicate and write. And when I, when my daughter and son graduated from college, I got them both note cards with their names on them. Uh, there's $39 from American Stationery. You can get them anywhere. And I said to my daughter, every time you have an interview, every time you meet somebody, you're going to write a five sentence handwritten note and send them to them. 
When I was younger, I used to have an inbox that filled with letters. I now get one letter, one handwritten note a week, maybe, maybe a month. Uh, it's everything's internet. But when you, someone, you send someone a handwritten note, it shows you care more about them. They will actually, I get these handwritten notes I get, and, or letters. I put them on the edge of my desk and I, I want to throw them away, but I keep them a while. Yet that internet, I kill, 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 kill. So learn to speak, learn to communicate. Get off the internet, use the internet to your benefit, but use your personal relationships to your benefit. And that is so truly important, especially in tourism as well, all around, uh, but especially in tourism. So thank you again, Roger, for all your insights. We would also like to thank all of you who joined us online for this session. And we would like to invite you as well to the next session of the George Talks Business Series. On November 3rd, we will host a very special edition in the series featuring the Richard Blackburn Endowed Lecture on Civility and Integrity with Dr. Dana Matthew, who's Dean, and Harold Green Professor of Law at GW Law. Dean Matthew will be interviewed by the GW School of Business, our Dean Anuj Merotra. The session will be uh, held in person and live stream. So we hope to see you there. Thank you.